Welcome back to another edition of The Talking Hedge. I'm Josh Kincaid, and this is a cannabis business podcast. Some interesting news this week out of Maryland. We have a company claiming that CBD has been trademarked. We'll get more into that story in a minute. Yesterday, Aurora Cannabis reported earnings. And this week, more to come is Canopy Growth, as well as the Supreme Cannabis Company, InMed Pharmaceuticals, and Neptune Wellness Solutions, all reporting earnings coming up. In the meantime, Canatech holds a medical cannabis conference in Panama, and the National Cannabis Industry Association, or NCIA, is holding a seed-to-sale show in Boston. The U.S. House Financial Services Committee is going to hold a hearing February 13th at 2 o'clock entitled Challenges and Solutions, Access to Banking Services, and Cannabis-Related Businesses. So let's just kind of dive right into banking, why that's a problem, what the limitations are, and what uh, the results have been. This article out of Puerto Rico points out a lot of issues with banking. There's a Florida man charging a $100 million fraud that basically took out the entire banking system in Puerto Rico. A pharmaceutical executive in Miami was found guilty of federal charges in connection with the $100 million scheme more than a decade ago that triggered the 2010 collapse of Western Bank, one of Puerto Rico's most prominent banks at the time. Convicted earlier this month on eight counts of wiring fraud affecting a significant financial institution following a 21-day trial before a U.S. district judge. According to the trial evidence from 2005 to 2007, this guy was a CEO of a publicly traded specialty pharmaceutical products and technology company. The fraud began in early 2005 when he entered a series of loan agreements with Western Bank in exchange for collateral and assets. Under the loan agreement, the bank advanced money based on the customer's invoices. However, the evidence showed that the organized that he organized a scheme to defraud Western Bank by creating dozens of fake customer invoices worth tens of millions of dollars. At the end of the scheme in the summer of 2007, Western Bank declared default on the loans, ultimately suffered losses more than 100 million, and shortly after the losses triggered a series of catastrophic events leading to Western Bank's collapse. Western Bank apparently was the largest bank willing to deal with cannabis companies, medical marijuana companies in Puerto Rico, a U.S. territory. And without that, they're left with nothing. So they're required, I believe, to make electronic deposits for tax purposes. But if they're forced to deal in cash only, that's not really feasible. So right now it's in limbo, up in the air, and creating issues. Seems like everyone's trying to create a solution. There's a lot of duct tape remedies like payment solutions. Um, We'll get into that a little bit later. Out of Florida, they are seeking banking changes for medical marijuana companies. Florida's chief financial officer, Jimmy Petronas, is citing a tremendous safety threat and citing executive power to allow banks to do business with multi, uh, with with state authorized medical marijuana companies. Medical marijuana has become a multi-billion dollar industry throughout the nation, but banks are shunning cannabis companies because pot remains illegal under federal law. Petronas outlined a letter to Trump stating the dangers facing dispensaries, mainly operating as cash only businesses, as banks and credit unions won't take the deposits due to the lack of federal clarity on cannabis banking. The size and staggering growth of the medical marijuana industry paired with limited regulated banking options puts patients and employees in dangerous situations as potential targets for criminal activity. In the meantime, these businesses are easy targets for criminals and criminal activity. Petronas asked Trump, quote, to consider administrative action in the interim to offer clear guidance to the financial services community on how they can follow our existing state laws without risk of penalty from federal regulators. We must reassure financial institutions that there will not be retribution for servicing businesses that act within the state's legal framework. The cash-only cannabis industry poses a serious threat to security of our communities, Petronas added. He asked that the federal government to step in to help now before an incident happens, and we're instead in a sad position of responding to the fact Santa Rosa has been handling financial transactions for cannabis companies in areas north of San Francisco. The credit union is limiting its size of deposits made by cannabis businesses so the institution can manage its capital raises and risking federal prosecution and investigation for handling financial transactions for those companies. 
Increasingly, credit unions are providing bank services to cannabis businesses, which are often rejected by private banks. This is because cannabis remains a Schedule I under federal law, and many are nervous about running afoul of U.S. governments by doing business with the industry. I find it interesting that there's a lot of investors that want another two to three years reprieve from. I find it interesting that there's a lot of investors that want another two to three years reprieve from banking legalization because that is the the fundamental ticket, if you will, for uh, full legalization, for full legitimization, and the ability to move forward both interstate and internationally. And yet these businesses can't really file bankruptcy yet. And so there's some interesting tax issues that go along with cannabis and cannabis investing. A Colorado cannabis greenhouse biller is trying to file chapter 11, but being a schedule one, you're not able to file bankruptcy within the the legal system. And so let's uh, dive into this and kind of see what's happening. There's a Denver-based marijuana greenhouse developer that's filing a bankruptcy after raising more than 15 million from investors. Currently, they owe 8.6 million to roughly 50 creditors. GroCo is filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy, which can be used to keep a business afloat by reorganizing and paying back debts over time. So GroCo is not a plant touching company. It was formed in 2014 to provide cultivation infrastructure and serve as landlord for legal cannabis businesses, as well as provide administrative support services, and dispute several million dollars which is owed to creditors, including a claim from Blue and Green, which sued GroCo last year for $2.1 million, asserting that the greenhouse builder failed to pay back loans. So it doesn't really go into the, the outcome, but I'm guessing that this is going to be thrown out, whether it's plant touching or not. I don't know if well i guess we'll see uh leave some comments uh, down below but my opinion is that this will probably be thrown out because it's a cannabis company and that they're not able to file bankruptcy but being a non-touching plant who knows up in the air we'll see trademarks and patents are also up in the air when it comes to you know federal requirements the the leaf isn't really something that has been able to be patented my understanding, there's only one company called Cannabis Basics, uh, a local company here in Seattle. All Warner was able to get what I believe is is the world's um, U.S.'s first patent, or excuse me, trademark with a cannabis leaf on it. But this company in Maine is claiming that they trademarked CBD coffee, and that comes from you know back in the early '90s. Their name is Coffee by Design. They shortened it to CBD, but the timing is is no coincidence. They just changed it for obvious reasons. And now they're claiming that their their name has been this thing the whole time, this acronym, and it's causing confusion, which you be the judge. There's a 25-year-old brand in Maine called Coffee by Design. Opened in 1994, selling coffee and espresso in an area of Portland once known as the Porn District. This is Portland, Maine, although that could be confusing with Portland, Oregon as well. They're claiming that within a few years, the coffee shop had a nickname amongst locals, CBD. And that wasn't an issue for a long time until CBD coffee came around. Things started to change when Maine legalized cannabis in 2016 as a broader loosening of cannabis regulations around the U.S. This brought attention to a little-known compound called cannabidiol, or CBD, a compound of cannabis and hemp that doesn't get you high, but can treat ailments like anxiety and insomnia, according to proponents. Soon, Portland, Maine, coffee shops began selling CBD, charging customers to add a few drops of their, into their java. So signs appeared around town offering CBD coffee and consumers started asking coffee by design. They had other places that that were offering CBD. So one customer was bewildered when a competing coffee shop told him CBD coffee included a $5 surcharge, leaving him to wonder if coffee by design was jacking up prices. The coffee by design owners say that they're fine with competitors offering CBD extract, but arguing that putting CBD coffee on the menu infringes on their trademark. For the last several months, the company's founders have been discussing their options with the attorney while thinking about how to best protect their trademark 
and staying true to the values of their collaboration and community. At the same time, they're getting ready to make phone calls to local coffee shops selling cannabidiol. The blame primarily lies with the lack of guidance in FDA confirmed research on CBD. Ultimately, CBD products don't have any labeling standards or dosage guidelines, and in many instances, customers aren't aware of how much CBD they're receiving in restaurants or coffee shops, and that using CBD in food and beverages, it's become difficult for some consumers to determine what items on a menu contain CBD and which ones don't. So until there's a better way to pass along this labeling and dosage info to the consumer, it could be difficult for CBD edibles of any form to thrive. We could wait for the FDA to give us approval, or we could just take it over state by state. So today you have 50 states, it would require 38 states or three fourths to ratify the two thirds resolution enacted by Congress to repeal the designation of cannabis as a schedule one drug. Since 33 states have legalized some form of cannabis and additional states are looking to at legalization, it's highly likely that five or more states would join an effort to remove cannabis from Schedule One of the Controlled Substance Act of 1970. In my opinion, one of the biggest indicators of legitimization or foreshadowing for the, the legalization is tax. We just know from, from in the past with the, the housing boom of 2008, states and cities, municipalities, government agencies, everyone relies on that tax, whether it's real estate or cannabis, it's not going anywhere because they're relying on that money. That's just the, the simple facts. So I look at stories like cannabis exempt from sales tax and <clears throat> producers arguing whether or not they have to pay it is an indication of legitimization. Whereas before we were doing anything we could just to be in business. And now that there are companies pushing back and saying, no, we're not gonna pay these taxes, we're exempt. That's just driving that legalization or at least legitimacy forward. In Albuquerque, New Mexico, one of the most prominent medical marijuana producers has filed a lawsuit against the state arguing that it is entitled to a 1.5 million in gross receipt tax deductions because medical cannabis products are considered prescription drugs under the state law. In a complaint filed in January 17th in the first district of Santa Fe, New Mexico, Top Organics Ultra Health alleges that the New Mexico Department of Taxation and Revenue refused to process the deductions due to the bias against medical cannabis. Quote, medical cannabis meets the definition of a prescribed drug under any common sense interpretation of the relevant status. In withholding a refund based on the deduction for prescription drugs, the Department of Taxation and Revenue has acted unlawfully. Ultra Health is arguing that in a complaint, it renders certifications for medical cannabis equivalents to prescriptions as defined by the law and that the licensed nonprofit producers like Ultra Health should be eligible for that deduction. They're seeking a $1.5 million refund, interest, attorney fees, and costs. The CEO and president of Ultra Health said that his organization pays millions of dollars in combined federal taxes, state taxes, licensing fees, and continues to pay gross receipts taxes despite disagreeing with the state's interpretation of the law. That burden is only going to grow and it gets passed on to the patients, said the CEO. The CEO also said that the lawsuits are not indications of litigiousness, but rather on ultra health being on the forefront of issues. It's a clear effort on our behalf to represent the views of the patients and to allow the producers to stand up for themselves. I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast that is cannabis pot earnings. Canada's two biggest cannabis companies report earnings this week, giving us the first glimpse of what recreational sales look like. Aurora Cannabis reports earnings yesterday. Canopy Growth reports Thursday. It won't tell us much about the normalized legal sales we'll look at, but there's plenty of headwinds in the first quarter, which will undoubtedly impact results. It'll help investors gain a window on how overall Canadian adult use market is progressing, as well as a relative ability for LPs to execute and gain market share early on. Canada legalized cannabis on October 17th. The rollout was not uniform across the country. So this week should give some much needed clarity on whether the supply chain problems have caused the shortages, whether or not they're going to be resolved, and whether sales are picking up in the current quarter. It's also going to be interesting to hear what they have to say about the plans for the U.S. market and how the hemp-derived CBD is legal. Canopy has already said that it intends to spend as much as $150 million to build a hemp industrial park in New York. 
but they haven't given you any details on that. Last week, we reported that more millennials were buying cannabis stocks than Apple stocks. This week, we're seeing that there's an ETF that exceeded the $1 billion mark. That's uh, ETFMG Alternative Harvest. And yet within that index, almost 20% is in one cannabis stock, which is almost the antithesis of an index. Rather than buying an individual security, you buy a portfolio or an index that gives you a lot of uh, diversity so that if one goes down, the whole portfolio doesn't go down. And yet one out of $5 is being bought on one company. So it's, it's a huge lopsided potential messy issue. Alternative Harvest top five stock holdings are Kronos with almost 3.5 billion and almost 20% of their holdings. Less than 9% goes to Canopy with almost 16 billion, then Aurora at seven and a half billion, 7.7%, five and a half percent for Tilray, that's over seven billion, and then Organigram Holdings, four and four point four percent for seven hundred million. So at first glance, the weighing scheme looks pretty odd. Most ETFs use a system that's based on market cap, a market capitalization that gives the largest companies the highest weightings. So using such a system, you'd expect Canopy and Aurora and Tilray all to have larger weighings than Kronos because their market caps are anywhere from two to five times higher than Kronos's market cap. However, not all indexes use straight market cap weighing. On its website, ETFMG refers to its trading index, the Prime Alternative Harvest Index, as its primary authority in making investment decisions. The prospectus makes limited reference to the actual methodology that the index follows, instead focusing on how it takes the information that the index provider gives and uses it to make its own investing decisions. What's likely to have happened is that the most recent rebalancing in December, most of the top marijuana stocks would have had roughly equal wings because of the specific restrictions in the index methodology. Ironically, those restrictions were designed to prevent the very overweighing issues that have had since that have resulted. The huge gains for Kronos following this decision of tobacco giant Altria to invest in cannabis companies were responsible for putting the ETF's wings out of whack. The ETF's next Rebalancing is in March. The methodology should work to pull Kronos Group's weighing back down to the line with its peers. From there, relative to performance, again, could lead to over or under weighing positions within the portfolio, but it would take massive share price movements to create the same situation again. Nevertheless, for at least the next month, investors in Alternative Harvest need to understand that they're making an outsized bet on the performance of Kronos Group. If it underperforms its marijuana stock peers, then it could have a detrimental impact on how Alternative Harvest does compared to its cannabis investment universe. That's a risk that many ETF investors aren't familiar with taking, but they'll need to take it into account here. So is there a winning strategy for cannabis investing? The cannabis industry so far has been a hotbed of investment activity. There's been plenty of ups and downs in the share price of cannabis stocks over the past several years. Given how new the industry is and how much competition there is among up and coming players in the space, it can be daunting to decide how to invest in a way that's both prudent and yet gives you a chance at strong returns. Conservative investors often look to ways to ride the coattails of the industry insiders. And one strategy that's been surprisingly effective in 2019 is also simple. Investing in the two cannabis companies that have made major deals with third party consumer, good, consumer goods giants both Canopy Growth and Kronos Group. There's been huge success uh, outpacing even the strong returns of the ETFMG Alternative Harvest ETF. Cannabis companies that haven't yet come up with partnerships have fallen behind their counterparts. Tilray in particular has been a notable laggard, and although a 16% gain in just a month would ordinarily be it for celebration, many shareholders wouldn't be happier if Tilray could attract a high-profile partner like Constellation or Canopy. If that were to happen, it's possible that Tilray's gains would come a lot closer to Canopy and Kronos' groups. On the other hand, penny stocks and cannabis fails to catch investor fever. There were 11 cannabis penny stock companies that hoped by changing their name would propel them into the next investment frenzy. Didn't work out. Whereas a couple of years ago, all you had to do was change your name to include CBD or THC, and then your stock price would go up. I mean, just look at last week up in Canada, Weekend Unlimited changed their name from YOLO to POT, 
and it increased their market cap 90%. 11 Canadian penny stocks hoped a name change would propel them into the next investor frenzy. Last year, these stocks were hovering around a dollar. They changed their name to include cannabis in the hopes that the share price would get a lift from the pot investing craze. They weren't so lucky. Since each changed their name, the penny stock dropped on average 30% through February and only one rose through yesterday's close. Prior to the name change, more than half of these penny stocks were involved in the precious metals business. Investors don't appear thrilled by the switch. To be honest, I'm kind of surprised that more dumb money they can get suckered into the name change. I still feel that there's a lot of frenzy and a, a lot of money to be lost by bad investments. Just kind of throwing money at speculation and waiting for the bubble to go up. I guess, I guess there's smart money or people don't uh, have as much disposable income to gamble. Not really sure which one it is, but either way, it's, it hasn't worked out as, as anticipated. A lot of focus is going into CBD right now. The U.S. hemp revenues is only second to China, and New Frontier data projects a $5.7 billion hemp sales in the United States by 2020. So with the, the, so with the farm bill that recently passed, there's going to be a massive addition of companies either establishing or coming back from Canada, having become essentially financial refugees leaving wherever they're from to go to Canada to file an IPO to get access to uh, institutional investor capital in order to become public, to get on an index, to, to sell as much stock as they can, to generate as much revenue as they can, and then use that to then come back into the U.S. Initially for hemp, establish all of the assets and the capital requirements they need to then make that transition into uh, THC products when the legalization happens. New Frontier Data's report on the global state of hemp 2019 industry outlook states that the global hemp industry reached 3.7 billion U.S. dollars in retail sales last year, 2018, and an annual growth rate of 15% driven by continued strength in the Chinese textiles, European industrials, Canadian foods, and the U.S. hemp-derived CBD market. China led all countries with nearly 12 billion U.S. dollars in hemp sales in 2018, followed by the United States, 10 billion, Europe, 980 million, and South and Central America, 220 million. The U.S. markets is positioned to grow under the 2018 Farm Bill with an estimated 2.6 billion projected in sales by 2022 with 13 billion in sales estimated for hemp-derived CBD products by 2022. As regulatory barriers diminish in the months and years ahead, businesses will continue to expand in ways in which hemp is utilized, especially across medicinal and industrial applications, said the New Frontier Data Founder and CEO. This report is the first in-depth quantitative and fact-based analysis of the global hemp industry since the United States 2018 Farm Bill and Canada's Cannabis Act passed two groundbreaking changes in North America that dramatically reshaped the entire hemp industry. By 2020, New Frontier data estimates the global market will reach 5.7 billion U.S. dollars across all markets, representing a three-year compounded annual growth rate of 175%. The U.S. hemp industry is set to boom under the 2018 Farm Bill. American farmers have a new crop and consumers are seeing an explosion of new and innovative products. Hemp, the ultimate triple bottom line for people, planets, and profits. Yahoo Finance had a live investor panel yesterday titled Risk Adjusted Returns. This was at the National Cannabis Industry Association seed this was called CannaVest. So it was a cannabis investor panel. The moderator was Scott of Viridian Capital Advisors. Um, panel was um, fully stacked, CEO or management of a cannabis company who our investors focusing on. Um, checks and balances, quality assurance, future branding, um, basically just where your bottom line. Then they kind of dive into what cannabis sectors are you investing in? Um, and I found it pretty funny that banking and payment solutions are a duct tape remedy and nobody's investing, not these investors at least. Um, they also they're not investing in cultivation. It's a race to the bottom. Uh, they're not investing in lighting. Which, which is good. I think there's LED options, but you know, high pressure sodium or a metal halide bulb that was used in, in street lighting for the 
1880s, over 100 years ago, I think it's probably something you don't want to invest in. Um, consumer real estate, that's, that's a bubble too. Who wants to touch that? So how will legal banking influence investor sentiment? So they're basically saying that once banking becomes legalized, how is investment going to change? And a lot of these guys didn't want banking to become legalized. They want a three to five year reprieve to be able to get more of an edge, more of an advantage. Because once legalization happens, once banking happens, then it's open to anybody. So found that kind of fascinating. But in the event that it does change and become legalized. There's going to be a shift in strategy from price driven to more of a merger and acquisition. So when someone's looking at valuations, trying to find a good value, they'll shift that strategy to just gobble up everybody. So you're going to see capitulation or consolidation um, and a lot of merger and acquisitions. The most valuable key segment uh, was data. Hands down, whatever you're doing, you need to collect data. There's a couple of interesting companies doing that. High Tunes Distribution is selling joints and they're just focusing on CBD joints right now. Uh, but they have a QR code, you scan that, you get a free download, a music, a song. But who knows what kind of data you're giving up, your contact list, a full access. And people just click yes, you have no idea what data you're giving away, but that's worth a lot of money. Also worth some money, uh, another key segment that investors are looking at, genetics and branding. It's just on the cusp of looking at brands where in the past they noted that you don't have a brand if you're not selling anything. Pre-money valuation is non-existent. If you aren't making money, you have no brand. So get some data, start selling stuff. And then a question was asked, how do you project regulatory changes to interstate transportation? That fragmentation gap in the three to five year financial model was pretty interesting. They were saying that there's essentially already an established distribution channel. So once legalization happens, these investors are under the impression that that's just going to happen automatically, that they're gonna know how to transport that like any other commodity. But who they're dealing with is different. I mean, how well are you gonna be able to go and find tomato farmers in every single state and make that work in unison? I mean, it's incredibly complex. You're looking, these are small time farmers and they're not really business savvy. And you think you're just gonna be able to come in and, and create a commercial distribution channel? I don't think it's gonna be that simple. There was an argument within the audience and they ended up cutting off the feed because there was somebody else who said, there's state providers. Why aren't you investing in them to just flip the switch when interstate uh, becomes legal? You have intrastate and entities in Washington and Oregon and California that can't work with each other. They're affiliated, obviously, same company even, but they just can't cross state lines in the event that you can. Um, the argument was that these existing transportation companies should have the investment capital so that they can scale up, whereas the investors, or at least these institutional investors, or I mean, they're not institutional, but they're they're limited in their knowledge too, right? They're, they have their subject matter expertise and they're, they're not comfortable investing outside of that. That's fine. I'm gonna disagree and say that there is an opportunity because you have to know cannabis. There's CEOs out there who have never touched the, the product. They don't smoke. They don't know anything about THC or CBD. Long term, that's not going to happen. You can't have somebody come in and not know the product then you don't know the culture and then it's just downhill. I don't care what it is. I saw it personally in banking when people were coming in from the mall. As long as you knew how to sell something, what's the difference, a mortgage or a wicker chair? There's a big difference. And now people don't really respect bankers. You don't go into a bank because you'd rather, well, actually you could just go and talk to a barista. Capital One offers you the ability to talk about your mortgage with a barista. No. I don't really think that that's long-term. I don't think that you're gaining the respect. I don't think that you're getting quality clients. So that's my argument.
Yahoo Finance reported live from the National Cannabis Industry Association conference in Boston, Massachusetts called CannaVest. There was another segment called Cannabis Market Trends and Consumer Insights. A couple of questions I found interesting that I wanted to note was, uh, what's the investment focus for 2019 for this panel? Um, and on the panel, you had people from Roth Capital, BDS Analytics, Canaccord, Genuity, Cohen and Company, Northland Capital. And so some of the questions that were asked is, what's the investment focus for 2019? And all of them repeated MSO. So the multi-state operators where you see MedMen, for example, are what people are looking at. Here locally, we've got a company that had five stores mandated by the state. That's the cap or was the cap for Washington State. And yet Have a Heart went out to, to gain $25 million in funding. They oversubscribed by 75 million. So they initially went from that series A, or seed, seed fund of 25 million to a series A of 75 million. And that got oversubscribed by 75 million. So they opened up a series B for that. So totally have 175 million and they can now look at over a dozen different states, I think they already have uh, with two dozen more applications. So coming from local to looking at multi-state is exactly what investors are looking for, is somebody who can scale up fast. And once you're able to start applying for dozens of licenses in multiple states, you're gonna start gaining the attention of these heavy hitter investors. But how are these companies making money in the cannabis industry? I don't know, you're gonna to have to check out my, my uh, review on that. Super Chronic Josh on YouTube, that's at the one minute 57 mark. The other questions and answers were asking, what do consumers want and will the FDA get involved? Essentially accurate dosing kind of came up as being a limiting factor and needing to be resolved wanted to know how will the retail experience change with the additions of delivery? I thought that was a brilliant question because if you have multi-state operators and everything isn't about niche or differentiation, it's about offering that experience. How do you offer that experience when people sidestep you with delivery? So then they said niche branding. I don't know, what do you think? And then what products would you recommend launching prior to FDA involvement? You're going to have to listen and find out. Another indication of cannabis legitimacy is the requirement, necessity, if you will, for marijuana business accounting. So here's some best practices from Marijuana Venture Magazine on accounting, tracking, and point of sale software. So if your cannabis business is already generating sales, you're likely using an accounting system geared towards a smaller business such as QuickBooks. So this article is going to assume that you're currently using or plan to use QuickBooks as your cannabis business accounting system. So the topics covered are generally applicable to other accounting systems. So here's pro tip number one, is utilize QuickBooks as the general ledger only for sales, cost of sales, and inventory. An important accounting concept to understand is the difference between the general ledger and subledger. Think of the general ledger as a subtotal of the details in the subledger. So for example, you have six different products in your dispensary. The subledger will contain a complete list of all six products and the quantity cost of each. At the bottom of the subledger, there's a grand total of the cost of all of the inventory in the dispensary or cultivation facility, whatever you have. And it's only the grand total that's shown in this general ledger. So due to the fact that you're likely using a separate product tracking system, don't attempt to recreate the sub-general ledger of sales, or cost of sales and inventory in QuickBooks. The system discussed here is inadequate to track these details for you. However, that being said, use QuickBooks as the sub-ledger detail for accounts payable in all cash transactions. In other words, it's a best product to enter all vendor invoices into QuickBooks upon receipt, regardless of whether the invoice paid in cash, check, or credit card. This practice allows you as the owner to know the outstanding bills payable at any time. In addition, it's vital that all receipts and use of cash are recorded in the cash ledger within QuickBooks. Pro tip number two is utilize QuickBook class functionality within a single QuickBooks file and use separate QuickBook files for each legal entry. 
So there's likely multiple entries, each with multiple locations and or departments involved in your dispensary operations, such as the state licensing entities, management or staffing companies, real estate entities, et cetera. So each legal entity plays an important role in the operations reporting of compliance of your dispensary and therefore a complete accounting record of each is required. So your tax prepper and auditor will ask you for these records each year and if you don't complete, or if it's not accurate, you'll incur higher professional fees for the correction or uh, if they have to create them. So first, create a separate class for each physical location, whether your dispensary or cultivation license, within the QuickBooks file of each licensed cannabis entity. You may even have subclasses with, within this dispensary or cultivation class representing each different department within these locations. Apply this practice to the other legal entity QuickBooks files. At any level, you may want to allocate and capture costs. Your accounting system likely has a variety of standards reporting by class or department that'll be helpful in analyzing which locations or departments are profitable. However, remember that this tip is only as good as the practice behind it. Therefore, every transaction entered into the accounting system should be classified accordingly. QuickBooks includes helpful standards reports you can run at any time to check the diligence of your accounting team. Periodically, ask your staff accountant for the balance sheet by class and profit by loss of class. Look for any balances in the unclassified column. If your accounting team is following this tip, there will be no unclassified columns in the reports. If there are, remind your team that every transaction needs to be classified properly. Next, ensure that your accounting team is set to separate QuickBooks files from each legal entity. If you want to be able to prepare com combined financials using the accurate software, you'll need to use QuickBook Enterprise instead of QuickBook Pro or QuickBook Online. It's very important for tax, audit, and company valuation purposes. Each legal entity needs to stand alone, exactly as if it were a totally separate and independent company. Do not fall into the temptation to account for all your legal separate entities as one, regardless of the level of common ownership between them. Accounting and tax rules are very strict as to the relationship between companies under common control. In addition, you will be miles ahead of the competition if you're able to provide complete and accurate financial information for any and all legal entities as the click of a button by following these tips in the article. Pro tip number three, use the same chart of accounts in each QuickBook file. When setting up your first QuickBook file, create a master chart of accounts in a worksheet. Consult with your accountant to properly tailor to fit the needs of your business. Upload the master chart of accounts into each QuickBook file you create. It's fine to have certain accounts that are only applicable to one QuickBook file. The reason for the standard chart of accounts across all QuickBook files will become evident as you consolidate financial reports from your separate QuickBook files. As your business grows, you'll likely need to add accounts to one or more QuickBook files. When you do, add the new accounts to the other QuickBook files with the same account number and description. Pro tip number four, keep all the details of sales, cost of sales, and inventory in the point of sale system. Utilize the point of sale system for your sales, cost of sales, and inventory subledgers. At the end of each month, and the grand total of your sales, cost of sales, and cha charge and inventory in the point of sale system to the respective QuickBooks general ledger accounts. There are various ways to accomplish this within QuickBooks, and your accountant can recommend a procedure that works best for you. However, avoid general journal entries and accomplish this using the design QuickBooks functionality, such as creating sales receipts and, transaction, and transferring costs between cost of sales and inventory because auditors are required to dig into general ledger entries recording during the time of year and subsequent year end. Limiting the use of your journal entries or general journal entries to actual corrections, it'll save you time and aggravation during an audit. Also, be sure to have a printed and or electronic copy of the month end sales, cost of sales and inventory balances outside of the point of sale system. These are important details that support your balances in your general ledger and will be needed at audit and tax time. Cannabis business owners are aware of the opportunities in the industry, as well as the complexities of dealing with partners, investors, regulators, auditors. So this three-part series features nine tips from an experienced accounting professional who has devoted hundreds of hours studying the industry. So these pro tips are designed to save time and money and position your company for success. Number one, 
Use your primary accounting system as a general ledger only for sales, cost of sales, and inventory. Two, use your primary accounting system's department classification and functionality within a single accounting file and use separate files for each ledger entry. Do not commingle a managed company or use other entities within your dispensary. Three, use the same chart of accounts in each company's accounting file. This will make it easier to prepare and confirm financial information. Four, keep the details of sales, cost of sales, and inventory and the tracking and point of sale system and archive monthly. Five, document and service the transactions between all of your dispensary related entities. Six, follow all intercompany contracts and pay records that the intercompany bills monthly. Seven, ensure all inventory is on your balance sheet at the end of each reporting period. Eight, create a separate cash general ledger account for each safe. Nine, develop and document process to determine total cost of goods sold and following it strictly. Maybe one of the most underlooked or underappreciated positions in the entire cannabis industry is a director of finance or a controller or chief financial officer because of their ability to manage finances, look for opportunities, valuations, uh, and overall financial operations. Financial modeling is important. So here's some key components for success from the Marijuana Venture Magazine. They go on to say that a well-developed business plan can improve profitability and bolster fundraising efforts. One of the most common components to success has been the early development of a dynamic financial model that can accurately reflect the key elements of the business. A comprehensive business and financial model outlining the plans for a company's growth and execution is critical for understanding profitability and cash flow, defining profitable growth, understanding scalability, and setting and executing goals. It can also be essential in raising capital if needed. Often companies are started with a great idea, it's quickly developed into a productive service, and yet many of these companies fail to put together a comprehensive financial plan that supports the profitability and long-term vision of the organization. But strong financial models not only bolsters several facets of a rapidly growing organization, but it also serves as the backbone for a pitch deck and goal setting activity. Prior to the development of a financial model as part of a strategic assessment, a company should consider external influences. There are several data points to consider, including defining your brand, understanding your brand, and how it's related to the market. So first, a company should consider its overall value proposition and what the brand represents. It's a crucial step because how a brand is defined will guide you in the pricing of your products and services and help you determine its cost base. So does your brand represent the high end of the market for the product or service or the budget-friendly version? Upfront brand definition will help you guide product pricing and will help serve as a determinant within the cost to support it. So for example, if a brand stands for a high-touch customer service, its costs will look different than a model with little client interaction. Another major external factor to be considered is the competitive environment. So are you a trailblazer where your product will be the first of its kind, or will you be entering a crowded market where there's fierce competition? You'll need to assess how your product or service compares to competitors and where you wanna position it relative to those competitors. It's a crucial step to assess the impacts and aspects of your financial model. To build the actual financial model, the company needs to consider pricing, variable costs, fixed costs, and tax laws, both state and county. So the company needs to consider its growth trajectory, how it can effectively scale its business. One needs to consider how the product will be priced and what types of discounts, if any, will be offered. So will you have a recurring fee for the product or service you provide? Will you offer repeat customer discounts? Or is your product or service a one-time customer purchase? So depending on the answer to these questions, your model will contain different attributes. Cost needs to be broken down into fixed and variable. Variable costs increase as each product or service is produced. <laughs> fixed costs tend not to change until critical mass is achieved. Costs should also be separated into manufacturing, sales, distribution, and support under these categories. Defining which costs are scalable versus those that are incurred with the application of each product or service will help to determine the scalability and overall profitability of what's being offered. This also allows you to assess cash flow and profitability. Many support and management costs fall into these fixed categories, 
for example, legal accounting and support costs. Additionally, taxes need to be taken into consideration. Tax laws vary from county to county and state to state, so it's important to familiarize yourself with how much your business needs to set aside for taxes. In addition to local, state, and federal taxes, companies need to be subjected to sales tax. If other areas to consider in a model are how much you plan to spend on advertising and sales. So it depends largely on how you plan to distribute your product and service and how you want to get the word out to the marketplace. Advertising costs can be more intensive for a startup compared to a known and well-established brand. Sales can also be variable. So if you compensate your sales team in a commission base on the number of products or services they sell, it's also determined how much money you need to continue refining the product or service to keep it relevant. The financial model should be designed to support monthly, quarterly, and annual projections and should be flexible enough to support shifts in pricing, quantities, product inputs, and tax calculations. It'll allow for a scenario analysis to outline how changes in variables can impact your overall financial health. It'll also allow you to have a dynamic real-time plan. So once your financial model is finalized, it can be leveraged for many different uses. So allow you to plan financial goals of your company to achieve, a pitch deck, which is instrumental in outlining the company's value proposition and raising capital. Regardless, a solid and well thought out financial model will serve as a foundation for your company's growth and will aid in the overall success of your business. And with that, we're gonna roll this one up. This is Talking Hedge, I'm Josh Kincaid, and I'm out.